Hey everybody, welcome to what is this day five of Creative Strings Workshop. Welcome everybody online for this special clinic on the music business, which I like to call the art of the hustle, also known as making money, making music. Um, it'll probably be a short clinic. We've got a few of our campers in here. Um, Creative Strings Workshop is um, a week-long event that happens every summer in Columbus, Ohio, and this is the 10th annual event. This year we've got 53 adults, 25 uh, youth, and uh, I don't know, about 20 support staff, musicians, and faculty. And it's a great place for creative string players, string players who want to do more than just play in an orchestra, maybe. And I think part of that, part of being a creative string player or a, or a creative musician or an artist really of any kind is how are you going to survive? I think there are two ways that we sort of, we can think about how we craft a living for ourselves. One way is, is where you interview for a job with a large institution or a company, <clears throat> like an orchestra, like a school, like a corporation, and you interview, and you have a nice resume, you go in and you, you hope that you get that job and you hope that it will be there for a long time, and you work for somebody else. And there are a lot of advantages to that. Uh, one advantage is that Supposedly, you have some stability, um, but that's not always true, of course. And, and nowadays, in orchestras, it's famously untrue. <laughs> there are only 16 or 17 full-time orchestras in the United States. And actually, here in my hometown of Columbus, Ohio, um, of many of the teachers who I grew up studying with who played with the Columbus Symphony Orchestra for 20, 30 years, have just in the last year or two had their their um, their income slashed in half, or 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 more than half, <laughs> or they're making less than half the money than they than they were originally. So there's not necessarily stability in working for other people. Nonetheless. A lot of people go to college um, and apply for certain jobs and major in certain fields just because they think it's going to be more stable. And I'm not going to argue with that idea. I'm not going to argue that you shouldn't work for someone else and have that stability because then when you get home from your job at 5 o'clock, maybe you won't have to worry about it. Somebody else can worry about whether the company's ge uh, generating revenue. Uh, the way that my parents supported them, their selves, and, uh, and my mom's mother and, and a tradition in my family was uh, having a small business and working for yourself. So <clears throat> my dad, who was a, a life insurance salesman, he had been a musician, but he was really young when I was born, so he decided to do something in business. So he worked on commission only, which means he would, you know, just call people and knock on doors, literally knock on doors. And that was the only money that he would make was from people that he would sell life insurance to. So I learned a lot from him because when I was young and trying to decide whether I was going to play in an orchestra or whether I was going to work a construction job, him and my mother both said, we really think that you should pursue your dream of being a musician. And we want to help show you the way to, to go get your own work, to go um, create opportunities for yourself. So this was when I was about 24 years old. And they said, you can stay at our house and uh, we'll, we'll show you what to do. Um, so one of the first things my dad suggested, he, he told me that I needed to call I needed to make a list of restaurants or hotels or cafes in the town that we lived in 
and try to go out and meet the managers, talk to the managers, and ask for an opportunity to come in and do a free audition at the restaurants. So I made about 15 or 20 phone calls, and I had about three, you know, five or six meetings and talked on the phone with some different people. Then I went in and I would audition at a restaurant. So I played a half hour of, of music for free, just a short audition for a half an hour. I brought in my guitar player. We played for free. We dressed up nice. Of those 15 to 20 phone calls, I probably got uh, eight auditions. And from the eight auditions, I got three venues that gave me a weekly gig. And one of the venues gave me two weekly gigs. So I was, I was working four nights a week after just those first two weeks. Um, I think I had a Wednesday night, I was making $75, and Thursday night I was making $125, and Friday, yeah, Friday about 100 bucks, and Saturday I had two gigs. So actually it was, it was five total gigs. But from those five gigs, I was making close to $600, maybe $600 a week. So at the same time, the symphony had called me to be like a, a permanent sub with their orchestra. So I was making a similar money with the symphony. This was 20 years ago, almost. But then I had to decide if I wanted to work with the symphony or do my own, my own gigs. And I decided to do my own gigs at the restaurants for a couple different reasons. Number one, I could hire musicians that I wanted to hire to work with me. Number two, I could decide the music I wanted to play. Although, obviously, I had to work within certain parameters of the restaurant that I was working at. Um, and I had, you know, I had to turn down. I couldn't just play forever and ever on one song. You know, I'd have to think about the audience a little bit. Uh, but it was also promotion for me because it was my name. It was I was the person that people came out and saw, and uh, and I could kind of practice on the gig. Really, I would hire musicians that I could learn from on the gig, piano players, and I would ask them questions when we took breaks. So I decided, and it was a little bit of a risky move, but I decided to tell the symphony, "No thanks, I'm just going to focus on doing my thing." And that was sort of 17 years ago, and that's really what I consider. The beginning of how I started my career and pretty much everything I've done since then I don't feel has been really that much different from what I did then. It was it really all came down to picking up the phone or walking in and talking to a decision maker and asking for that opportunity. In this case I was asking for an opportunity to give him something for free, a free half hour of music at his restaurant. Um, so from, from that point, that's pretty much all I've done, is just focus on, well, I know if I keep asking, if I, if I keep putting out um, the ask and asking people for the opportunity to serve them, that some people are going to find what I have to offer valuable. And, um, and even this camp that I'm running today, Creative Strings Workshop, is an example of that. And the people that are here today and the people that come every year, they come because I have asked them for the opportunity to serve them in a way that hopefully will help. Them. Um, so I just want to talk about that a little bit. And if, if you have questions, feel free to ask. Um, artists typically have a mindset in which they believe that selling themselves is somehow uncool. Most of the artists that I meet believe that they should just get good at what they do, and if they're good at what they do, opportunities will come. I completely disagree with that. I think it's, it's, it's a very small percentage of the time where things happen that way. Um, I mean, sure, if you're good at what you do, then naturally some people will know about it, and eventually you will get some opportunities. But in order to escalate those opportunities, and to, and to develop them um, more fully, I really believe that you have to chase the opportunity. You have to go to uh, your market. And as a musician, you might have different markets. You have the capability to produce revenue streams from maybe 10 different types of services. You can teach, you can perform, you can record, you can compose, you can arrange, you can copy. 
you could, you know, do these kinds of things. So the story that a lot of musicians tell themselves is, I'm going to practice, I'm going to practice, I'm going to practice, and then once I'm good enough, opportunity will come and I'll get my chance and I'll make money or I'll get to play with the people that I want to play with or I'll get to play the music that I want to play or whatever. I think that it works the opposite way. I think that you have to seek out the opportunity and when you get the opportunity, like like let's say you want you want a gig. <laughs> um, rather than practicing until you have enough repertoire to play the gig, I think that you should get the gig and once you have the gig, then you'll be forced to develop the repertoire that matches that particular gig. Rather than putting together a band and then getting a gig, I think you should get a gig, and then that's going to force you to put together a band that, that fits that opportunity. Um, so this idea that business activity fuels, motivates, and informs artistic development. That's what I believe, and it's sort of upside down from what most people think. Again, most artists think, I'm going to get good, that's going to give me opportunity. I think, no, I'm going to get opportunity, that's going to make me better. Case in point, in my career, um, those five gigs a week that I played in restaurants, that's where I learned to play jazz. If I didn't have those gigs, I never would have learned to play jazz. Um, and everything that I've done along the way, learning to teach, I learned how to teach because I got a gig as a teacher and then that forced me to learn how to teach. I didn't study teaching and then go ask for a gig. So the reason that I think a lot of, part of the reason that I think a lot of artists have this, this story that the, they tell themselves is because people are, um, they think that selling, they think that selling is sleazy. So I want to talk about sales, what what you think sales is, and what I think sales is, and what, and what I think you should think about sales. So I'm going to use my father again as as an example, because he taught me a lot. Um, so when you think about an, a, a life insurance salesman, it's almost like the epitome of of a, of a salesman, right? Something that knocks on everybody's door and you think, oh, that's so sleazy. I don't want somebody to pitch me. I don't want somebody to sell something to me. <clears throat> but I really respect my father um, for what he for what he for what he did for a living. And I want to talk to you about his mentality as a salesman. First of all, my father believed that the best thing he could do for his family, one of the best things he could do for his family was to have a life insurance policy in place. Because if my father were ever to die, then his family would be protected by that life insurance policy. So he felt that that was like his duty as a family man to provide for his family, especially when he was gone. It, if you think about it, it's a very selfless thing to do. What could be more selfless than to provide for your family when you're gone? So my dad believed that. And when he talked to other men or women, he really thought that he was going to enable them to do the best thing they could do for their family as well. So he really believed in this, and when he would talk to people about it, he would be really passionate. Um, he believed that he was giving somebody something valuable. So when he sold to them, he, he, he sold to them with that mindset. Let me have the opportunity to tell you about life insurance and how it's going to be a good thing for you and your family. You know, He saw it as providing them a service. Not taking their money, but providing them a service, enabling them to have something good in their life. Um, and at the same time, when he did that, my father saw that as him doing his duty to his family, because he was also supporting us by making money by selling. So those are the two kind of ideas in my mind about selling. Number one, selling is about giving value to people. And number two, 
selling is your duty to take to yourself, to take care of yourself and to take care of your family. This really flips it on its head from where most people, from what most people think about selling. People think that selling is about taking. And people think that selling is, I think some people think that selling is an indulgence. They don't think it's a duty. So why do we have this feeling? Why do we have this discomfort about selling ourselves? I read a book called Call Reluctance, The Fear of Self-Promotion, which I thought was a great book. And the way it explained the answer to this question was, it said, most of us are, were brought up to have good manners and not to be like a stage hog, not to steal the show, not to be overly self-promoting. And so a lot of people are afraid to sell themselves because they feel that they'll be overly self-promoting. What the book said, and what I sort of agree with, is that we don't really have a realistic perspective about where that line is as far as uh, being too self-promotional. So I'll just give you I'll just give you an example, okay? I'll give you an example. Can I get it? Can I get a guinea pig from the off uh, the audience who wants to take my sales pitch right now? Um, okay. All right, Allison. Thanks. All right. So, uh, so this is just an example. This is this is just a hypothetical situation. But um, no, let's let's just consider it a real situation. All right. So, Allison, I want to thank you for coming to Creative Strings Workshop this year. And um, I want to ask you if you're considering coming back next year or if you will consider coming back next year. Yes, I'm considering it. You're considering it? Yes. Well, thanks. That's great. That's great. That's great to know. Um, is there anything that I could do to help give you information or stay in touch with you about next year to, to facilitate your coming back if, if in fact that works? with your schedule and with your budget and with, you know, all your other plans and priorities? Yeah, well, what I want to do is find a way to break down what I've, I've absorbed the last year and to carry that with me in a way that fits my lifestyle on a daily, day to day, you know, so that when I come back, I'll feel more prepared uh, and I can show that how much better I am. That's great. <laughs> yeah, Okay, great. So I think what I heard you say is that you do, you want to make sure that you're able to follow up on what happened this year, yeah. so that you'll you'll be able to evolve going into next year. And so maybe there's something I could do to help with that. And mm -hmm. you, yeah, that's great. And, and I would like to help with that. I think there's some different options, um, and and we can talk about them more later. But but for example, I have online materials, and I also do Skype lessons, and and there might be a way that I could come out on the road and meet you and give you a lesson, for example. So. Mm -hmm. So this was an example of me doing a sales pitch. And um, first of all, I want to ask you, Allison, if you felt that my sales pitch was aggressive or sleazy or um, intrusive or which is what you felt about it. Because I want everybody to remember what I asked her, which was, w would she consider coming back? It's important to think about what I was asking, what I was pitching. I wasn't, I wasn't saying, give me money right now, sign on the line, whatever. I was saying, would you consider coming back? So, how did you feel when I approached you with that, with that question? I, I thought, you know, I didn't think it was uh, heavy-handed, and I thought it was consultative, you know, because you were, you were looking for a way to build a service into it, you know. That's great. Anybody else? Did anybody else perceive it differently? Like, did, did anybody else feel like, oh man, that was so, like, I was trying to be smooth, or that it was like that it was hard sell, or, or I don't know, any well, observation. If I said no. If you said no, then you said no. But would you say, well, is there something that I could do to make it better for you, a better experience for you? I mean, would you go that, would you take that route? I might, yeah. 
we can and we can definitely talk more about the i mean mechanics of the sale and i don't want to claim that i'm like mr expert in terms of you know the mechanics of every sale and and you know structuring the sale i have i sort of have just like basic really basic principles that i try to follow when it comes to that and the idea is one of the ideas is is if you don't know what to ask people for you can you can ask for something that's small and it's reasonable you don't necessarily have to ask people always to give you money but you can ask people to tell you what they think about you or to give you feedback you know which is sort of like i'm asking you to give feedback about this program and whether or not you'd be open to coming back in the future and then and then building on that one way or another and then out of that it it, it comes out that there might be other ways that i could serve you you know through different teaching methods but um but if you said no i don't want to come back then i'd say okay i respect that and is was there something that you think i could improve about this program um, I might say, is there somebody else that you would recommend that might be a better fit for the program? I would say, is there, would you still like to work with me in any other ways? You know, I might, I mean, I could, you know, I could go in a lot of different directions, but, uh, but I would be centered around you as my client, you know, as, as the person that I'm sort of, you know, serving as part of my market, I guess, if you would. Um, but go ahead, Pauline, do you have a question? Yeah, that's, those are great questions, and I don't know if I if I have if I'm if I have the expertise honestly to to give you the best answer to those questions. You know, again, I, I, I sort of I kind of stop at, at maybe the 100 level class of you know like talking about my experience and what's worked for me and how I've I've taken you know sort of this the experience of, of my parents and my family, their history, learning from my father along the way, every question I had when I started my business, and this idea of, it's, it's, it's pretty simple, it's pretty simplistic really, the way I do my business. It's like every day I get up and I figure it's sort of my duty to myself and my duty to my family to go out and support my family and support my dream to be a musician. And the only way that, that I feel is going to be the most stable way to do that is to, to, to look for anywhere that there might be an opportunity and then to ask for the opportunity, to ask for wherever I can provide value. And it's, it may not be that, <laughs> it might be kind of simplistic, but on the other hand, it's, it's what I would credit for my you know, a lot of my success and to whatever degree I have succeeded as an artist also or developed as an artist, I give a lot of the credit to my business development because as I said, I feel like when I'm constantly in all these situations, it makes me grow as an artist. And that's part of why the Creative Strings Workshop was envisioned the way it was because when I force you to like go like find directions to some weird gig and go to the gig and have to plug into your amp and have to deal with noisy people in some foreign place or whatever. That's like part of the formative experience that makes you really grow as a musician. Or when you're in an ensemble class with four other people at 11 in the morning and you're tired from yesterday and you and I'm like, okay, we got to play this tune now. Allison, go ahead and walk that bass line. And you're like, oh, wait, wait. You know? It's like, that's part of what I feel like kind of like pushes you to the next level because that's what pushed me to the next level. And as violin players trying to play in jazz, we all feel sort of like we've all got these obstacles that we have to overcome, but it's by overcoming those that, that we, we get there. So for example, when I was young, you know, I would try to go to jazz jam sessions and people would see me coming a mile 
aisle away, oh, here comes the violin player. We're not going to let him play on the stage. We're going to come up with every story to try to not let him up here. That was one of the biggest barriers that I had to overcome was like to figure out how to get to know jazz musicians and, and, and get them to accept me and get them to work with me. And as I said, one of the ways I did that was I just created the gigs myself as a band leader. And then I called the band. <laughs> so I was a band leader before I knew anything about jazz music. But I was the guy with a gig. And if you have a gig, you can get the best piano player in your town to play with you as long as you can pay that, that guy. <laughs> you know. So I'm sorry, I may not have the best answer for your question. I think, but again, just on a simplistic level, no matter who it is that you're trying to sell to, you may want to qualify who those people are. But once you do, it's about, are you willing to have that conversation with them? Um, does that, probably doesn't satisfy you at all. <laughs> and we talked about this in camera. I think, you know, because, because, <laughs> you know, because, because um, you're a, a really talented musician and you've, you're, you're experienced as a professional, so you have tons of skills, and but maybe not um, focusing all of your energy on doing what you want to be doing. And so for you to focus that energy on what you want to be doing, I think what I suggested to you was, well, make a list of, you know, of, the, of, of the things that you want to do. You want to perform as a jazz violinist with your own trio. You want to do it in around Australia, you know, for starters. Maybe, and then, so, so make a list of where are all the opportunities for that. Could be like corporate gigs, wedding gigs on one hand, but then it could also be like more festivals and more concert series on the other. And then you could do that as a leader, but you could also reach out to other band leaders and try to have them hire you. I remember we had a long couple days in Canberra and a nice conversation at a beautiful restaurant there. But um, I still think I would say the same thing today that I said to you last year, which is if you take an hour every day just to make those phone calls and just to work on that, just like you practice the violin. You practice the violin, well, you should, for maybe a couple hours a day, well, you should take an hour a day or two hours a day to, to work on the business. Um, so maybe I can go a little more in depth into that. Are there other questions about that? I feel like I just kind of got sidelined a little bit. I'm sorry. <laughs> I might have lost my own train. Any questions about this this idea of, I mean, who, who here in the room feels like this would, this even, you can even relate to this at all? Or do you feel like you don't relate to it? Oh, you do? Okay. So, so in the sense that, like, for example, you don't feel comfortable picking up the phone or showing up and just asking for a gig, is that how you can relate to it? Like, like it feels uncomfortable? I feel that the rest of my family might not value the music as much as I do. So oh. that's where I find I feel uneasy when I pick up the phone or when I go in. Interesting. So, so I feel I've got to convert them. Right. Oh, you feel like you have to convert them. I see. Yeah. Well, you know, maybe the way to convert um, somebody like that is, is to think in terms of their needs. And this is another idea about sales, I mean, most people when they think about sales, they think it's all about the salesperson, you know, that it's taking, 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 that I want your money and I want this and I want that. But a lot of the sales books that I read, you know, they stress this idea of creating a win-win situation or really focusing on the needs of your client, I guess. So in the case of the restaurant, um, what I would do is is I would think, what are the needs of the, what does the restaurant want? They want to make more money. They want to have their clients be happy. They want to have a nice ambiance, blah, blah, blah. So how can you provide that? One way is by, you know, looking really nice, coming in and just provide creating energy in the restaurant, in the space, you know, adding extra value for those, those um, customers that are eating in the restaurant, you know, maybe talking to them playing some nice music, blah, blah, blah. Um, and again, what I would do, consider is doing the free audition, saying, hey, I want to come in and just show you what we can do, the kind of energy we can bring to your space, and maybe help you eventually make more money that way. And if you do go in and do that, 
um, some free auditions at some restaurants, um, you might find that that they would see it. They'll, I mean, they'll either get it or they won't. So if, if, if after a half an hour you play, um, you go to them and say, what do you think? How, do your, how does your customers like it? Is this something you'd be interested in? Then they can say yes or no at that point. I think that would be, that would be how I would handle it. So, um, someone told me a story about Chris Bodie. I don't know if you know Chris Bodie. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name, if it's Body or Bodie. But he's the trumpet player. He's really successful now. He worked with Sting. And this was just kind of through the grapevine that I heard that he had this work ethic for a long time, since college that he, he had a very simple thing he would do every day, which was to make a certain amount of phone calls every day. Maybe it was five phone calls or something like that, or 10 phone calls. But he would do it every day. So he'd make a list of the people he wanted to call. He had in mind whatever it was he wanted to connect with him about. But he'd make those phone calls every day. You see how successful he is. I mean, he's a really good player, from what I understand. You know, and now he's just a, a huge success. So what I would ask all of you to do as sort of an assignment or like a, you know, an exercise in terms of developing the career opportunities you want is first of all, to make a list of the things that you want. So in your case, you, maybe you want more gigs. Um, maybe you want more students. Maybe you want to play music with uh, certain kinds of musicians. Uh, maybe you want to um, be a composer. Um, maybe you just want to play, do what you're doing now, but make more money doing it. I don't know. But I would make a list of whatever those things are. Then I would make a list of all the different possible ways that you could make that happen. Like if you want more gigs, let's say, well, then make a list of all the different kinds of gigs you could possibly do. And don't rule anything out. Like I said, it could be corporate gigs, it could be wedding gigs, it could be um, clubs, festivals, performing arts centers, home concerts, uh, broadcast concerts online. And then start to kind of weed through that list and, and see which of those you, you want to do the most. Then make, a, make another list <laughs> of, of all the possible people that you could contact or the different ways that you could try to get those gigs. I'll use Columbus, Ohio, again, my hometown, as an analogy. So, first of all, I went to hotels, I went to restaurants, I went to clubs, I went to cafes, and I went straight to the decision makers and I would ask them for a gig. That's one thing I did. Then also I went to every band leader in town. And I asked them if they would hire me, because that's more of like a sideways referral. Then I went to every agency, booking agency in town. And I tried to learn about what the booking agencies did. Oh, they do weddings, or they do um, bar mitzvahs, or certain types of things. They need a strolling violinist. They need string quartets, whatever it was. And then I tried to, I tried to fill those needs. But then I also went to other vendors flower shops, churches, um, like event centers. And I would ask those people if there was a way that I could work with them or if they could refer me. Because a lot of times a flower vendor will be, you know, working with an event planner. So they could refer me as a musician. So I, I just, I would go through the phone book at the time I would call every single person. I try to go get an appointment, go meet for them, meet with them, maybe buy them lunch, make a business card if I needed a business card, make a flyer if I needed a flyer, make a CD if I needed a CD, make a, anything that I needed to kind of sell myself in that arena. Over time, it just, you know, it just bloomed into more and more opportunities, more and more relationships. And as long as I was centered around, you know, service to those people that I was 
working for. As long as I always remember that it's not about me, that it's about them, I felt like that helped me succeed. Like when I play a gig at a restaurant, it's I'm not going to play just as loud as I want. I'm going to play as loud as the people paying me want. It's not just about the music I want to play. It's the music they want me to play. I'm there to provide a service, you know. And I tell myself that every day here at this camp. <laughs> you know, you know, I'm here to serve you guys. You guys are here, and I want you to have a good time. It can't be about me. The moment it's about me, I will alienate people, and I will, I'll fail. So I, I really believe that seeing what you do as being a service provider, it helps you to remain focused on on your your customers, which also ultimately serves you well, um, and it also helps you to be a better salesperson because you are thinking about what is it that they need and how can you give it to them. Yeah, good question. In my, in my um, area, in probably, I'm probably not meeting this, especially the restaurants, they want to know that they're going to draw. You know, they want to know that you're going to bring in people. Um, and that you have 4,000 Facebook hits. And that you have, you know, they want, they want, if they believe in you, it's because all these people are coming and buy drinks. It's not just like good music. So if you, if you face that and, and you, do you have solutions for that? Absolutely. Yeah, some of the times if you play like at a restaurant, for example, um, they may just want you to be like background music and they may not care if you're really bringing in people, but they just see it as like you're an ambiance, providing an ambiance there. But you're right, sometimes they really want you to draw people in. And there's nothing wrong with starting a mailing list and uh, promoting your gig and trying to get people out there. There might be limits to how fast you could do that or fast, how fast you can have an impact, but you can promote your gig in creative ways. Um, again, promoting your gig is, is sort of, again, it's, it's, the same, it's the same dynamic at work when you're selling yourself. So are you willing to sort of tell people like, hey, I'm gonna be here, will you come out? Would you like to come out? There's a reason you should come out and hear us play music here. We're going to make it fun. It's going to be a good time. Sometimes people get gigs, but they're afraid to ask people to come to their gig. Now, I don't believe in asking people, come to my gig and support me. <laughs> I think, you know, the whole PBS thing. I mean, it's cool that PBS needs to be supported or whatever, you know, that's or NPR. That's fine. But I kind of feel like, I don't know. I've <laughs> I feel like there should be another reason that people want to come out. They should come out for them. So I want to give them a reason why they should come out. I mean, I think Pauline, when, when she put on my concert in Canberra, she did an amazing job getting, I can't believe how many people you got out to my concert. But, but she just pushed it so hard. You know, she just pushed and pushed and pushed. Um, and I think she told people that they just needed to come because they just couldn't afford to miss it because it was just too important. And it was going to be such a good thing and it would be worth it. And they just needed to do it. You know, and if they knew what was good for them kind of thing. But also, it, she might have created this sense among people that it was the place to be and that they were going to come and see everybody else there. So if you can do that, if you have a gig at a restaurant, if you can create this sense of we're having this thing and everybody's going to be here and you should come and be a part of it. If you come, it'll be fun. We hope you come. You know, whatever. Tell people about it. You know. So then just putting a lot of energy into that promotion. You can't force people to come, but you can push and push and push. You don't have to ask them to come support you, but you can tell them about it and you can tell them why you think they should do it and just get in their face. <laughs> um, it, it definitely it definitely helps if you go to a restaurant and you say, you know, I'm going to bring people or I will promote it. You can do, you know, press releases, um, find an angle, you know, you can, you can hit your mailing list, you can tell your family, you can tell your students, you can tell other teachers, whatever, and then you start to get a little buzz about it. But it, it, it's a job, you know, promoting is a job in and of itself. This camp has been happening for 10 years, 
And so I've had to keep pushing it over 10 years to get it to where it is today, where we have 53 <laughs> adults and you know, 22, 23 kids. But every year I have to promote, promote, promote. And that's just part of the gig. I want to see if there's other questions. I've sort of exhausted like pretty much what I wanted to say. Uh, I think it's pretty simple. But, um, oh, there is one other thing I'll say about the, um, the um, how to sell yourself and how to, how to grow your business. <coughs> you should have, like, a address book and a calendar, and they should be connected. When I say address book, it could be, like, a paper book, but it's probably better to do it on computer these days. So, just something that has your people's contacts and any descriptive information about them that you need. So-and-so's name, email address, phone number, who they are, how you met them, any conversations you've had with them, and then their preferred method of, of contact. Some people say, just text me. Some people want a phone call. Some people want a postcard. Some people want an email. Try to think about that. But basically, you want to have each of those contacts. And then you want to have a calendar. And in your calendar, you want to have listed who you're going to contact when. So like everybody that came to this camp this week, I'm going to put in my calendar to contact you at some point after this camp. Because there's clearly there's a reason for me to follow up, or many reasons maybe to follow up. So I might send you an email. I might give you a personal phone call. If I'm in your town, I might come out and see your gig. I might send you a letter. I don't know. I might just send something on Facebook. I might do a combination of those things. It might be impersonal. It might be personal. It depends on who you are or how busy I am or whatever. But I will put it on my calendar, and I will follow up one way or another. And, it, and at the very least, it'll be once a month when I send out my newsletter. And that's part of the reason for the newsletter. And when I do my newsletters, I always, almost always try to make sure that I'm giving something in the newsletter, that I'm not just selling something in the newsletter, but that there's, hey, the, re, the last newsletter I put out was last week. And, the, and pretty much it was announcing that there were going to be six days of free streaming presentations for anybody that's not here this week. And this is one of the streaming presentations. So I always make sure that when I send out that newsletter that I'm offering something that could be valuable. But it's also a way to follow up and keep the contact going and see if there's opportunity for further collaborations. So you need to put it in your calendar. Um, every time you contact somebody, whatever it is that you're going to contact them about. You should, call, you should contact somebody either because you're going to ask them for a specific opportunity, like a gig. You know, you're going to ask them to pay you to do something. Or you're going to ask them for a referral to somebody else that might pay you to do something. Or maybe you're just going to ask them for advice. My dad used to tell me, um, oh, I'm going to put you in touch with this person. You should meet this person. Oh, and you should meet this person. He's a really important person. You'll have a lot to talk about. And I said, "Why? what am I going to talk about to this person? What am I going to ask this person for? I have no idea how I can relate to this person. If the president of a university, why, what is he going to want to talk to me about? <laughs> you know, I'm just a 24-year-old violin player. You know, what is he going to get? He said, well, if you don't know what to ask somebody for, ask them for advice. Because a lot of times people, they like to give advice. They want to feel important. They want to feel needed. They want to feel powerful. They want to feel connected. These are pretty much the things people want. This is another reason that selling is a, is a two-way thing. And that, you know, when a, when a salesperson connects with a customer, they're, they're giving that customer something, too. It's the same reason that... Um, somehow it's the same reason that, that, uh, that men are afraid to ask for directions. And women don't mind asking for directions. 
at least according to some of the studies that I did. They said, the, the way that men look at the world, the man, a man sees himself on a ladder of one up and one down from other men. So a man doesn't want to ask for directions because if he asks for directions, he's putting that other man one up above. Whereas a woman may not have a problem because a woman sees the world as a web that she's connected with other people. Yeah. It's about building connections. So a woman has no problem asking for directions because they're connected. I'm oversimplifying it, please. But so if you ask somebody for a, for a gig or for advice or for a referral, you are in, in effect putting that person one up. You know, um, I think that's also another reason that men might have a problem with sales in general because they feel that it, it really puts them in this powerless position. So. Um, so again, this is just this, this dynamic of selling, how you conceive of selling. So I talked about, where was I going? I was up, almost about to wrap this up. <laughs> um, three reasons to contact someone. Ask for a gig, ask for a referral, or ask for advice. If you ask someone for advice, a lot of times, if they have time, they'll be happy to share advice with you, and then they'll do more than that. They might give you a referral, they might give you a gig. It gives you that chance to build that connection with them. If you call someone and you ask them for something, and they say, no, I don't want to give you a gig, then you can either say, thank you for your time, best of luck, goodbye. Or you can follow up and say, well, do you have any advice for me? Or, well, do you know somebody else that might be interested? That's fine. But if you get a no from somebody, that's great. You move on to the next person. But if somebody says anything other than no, if they say, not now, I can't book you because you don't have a big enough name. I can't book you because I'm already booked this year. I can't book you because my budget's already spent for this year. Um, then you say, okay, so not now, you can't book me, so when should I contact you about next year when your new budget comes in? You know, And then you set in your calendar to follow up with them at that time. And you keep doing that ad infinitum forever until they say no. If they say no, great. You go to somebody else that has, that has said not now or said maybe or said contact me in six months, call me next, you know, call me next year. A lot of people don't, they think that the sale is just the first time, but most sales, it's not the first time. It takes a couple years, five years, depending on what it is. Um, it just like in the rule of advertising, a lot of times you have to see something seven times before you're willing to, you know, really take it seriously and actually consider you know, buying in. So, for example, I played the Tri-C Jazz Festival early on in my career. Um, I, had, I had connected with Willard Jenkins, who, who runs the Tri-C Jazz Festival, or he did, he programmed for the Tri-C Jazz. And I really didn't think that I was ready for a big festival like that, like that they would take me seriously, like nobody knew who I was. But I found a grant to hire a consultant. It was an advisory grant. They would give a small amount of money for me to pay somebody to help me build my career as an artist. So I reached out to this guy, Willard Jenkins. I said, I've got this small grant, it's a little bit of money to pay you to give me advice. And he was like, great, okay, we can exchange some emails and I'll give you advice. I was like, okay, cool. And so that was kind of how I built a relationship with him. I brought something to the table for him. Um, and after that, I asked, would you book me at the Tri-C Jazz Fest? He said, I can't do it this year. I said, okay, Can I, when should I connect with you? Call me next year in, in October. Okay, marked it on my calendar. Next October, I called him. He said, I'm sorry, we can't do it this year. Call me next year. Okay, marked it again, October. 
called him that year. He said, uh, get back to me next week. I said, okay, when next week? Wednesday, you want a phone call? Okay, called him that week. No, get back to me in three weeks. Okay, got to him in three weeks. He said, ah, I'm sorry, it's not gonna work this year. Call me next year. I did it again. Five years I did that, the fifth year I got the gig. But it was a huge gig, it was a great gig, it was worth it. <clears throat> and, you know, so you have these contacts that you're, that you're staying in touch with. You've got a calendar and you've got a database of contacts and you just keep them organized and you just keep the conversations going. And over time, it builds into a lot of work. to a question like that. Because people do say that it's bad to undervalue yourself. A, uh, a bad answer. It's bad to give away what you do for free, for example. But on the other hand, there's cases where you may want to do that. Or you may want to give something away to, for free to somebody, but like, well, for example, in the case of this camp, like I contact some places and, uh, and I say, we'll come and play, but you have to give our musicians a free coffee. <laughs> it's not going to be totally free because I don't I don't want to go to that point where people devalue what you do. Right. Yeah. I know. And I talked about how I did a free audition, and some people would say, "Well, that's bad because you're undervaluing yourself." But when I do the free audition, I make it short. I do it for a half an hour, and I feel like that impresses people. It makes an impression that you're serious. And you also give them a chance to see what you do. It's like, hey, I'll show you what I do. Now you see how serious I am. I came and I met with you. You're getting to know me. You know, people have to get an impression of who you are. I'll talk to people about my camp on the phone. I put my website on my phone, on, or my phone number on my website. I say, you want to call me and ask me any questions about anything, anytime. About jazz cello, about jazz violin. We talked on the phone, I think, for 10, 10 15 minutes, maybe. And, you know, I said, well, let's talk about it. what are you trying to do, blah, blah, blah. So for me to, to spend that 10 or 15 minutes, maybe I didn't even have it or whatever, but still, it's important. Like, I want to show you that I'm serious about this, that, you know, and give you a chance to develop a relationship with me and see that, that I care about you and I care about your goals and, and that maybe I can help you with them or that I understand what you're going through and that, that I might be able to help you with it. So it's... So I think it's about drawing that line somewhere. Like, like it is important to give, you know, but you do draw lines. I might not have talked to you for an hour. You know what I mean? I mean, it's like I might have said, okay, well, I've got 15 minutes, and I'll happily give that to you, and then, and then I've got to go because I've got two kids, <laughs> and my wife is like, you know, needs me to be home. Oh, right. You're saying, how did I build from that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, when I... changed. You know, the amount of making changed. What's that? The amount of making changed from the first three years, the five hours a week, you know, so 75 bucks for this guy, and that's, you know... That's true. That's true. When I was doing these restaurant gigs, you know, they then they developed into more people coming out to the restaurants, and then they would ask me to do weddings and private parties. And then I had so many people that wanted me to do private parties on the weekend and you could charge more for a private party um, that then I started contracting for other musicians in town because people would want me in three places at the same time on Saturday. So then I basically became like sort of like a booking agency where I would send other people out. But it was really the fact that I was always the guy that was on the phone, that I was always the guy that was had the relationships with people. That was the thing that led to all the other opportunities that, that I've got throughout my career that I just kept following up and pushing and put, you know, and, um, and that's why I've, I've made more money and found other ways to create revenue and stuff like that it was because I was constantly the one that was generating the work 
and so there's a difference between the, you know the side some of the side guys the guys that I hire to play with me may be much better musicians than me but they don't get on the phone and they don't call and get the gig and it's and it's the person who gets the work is the person who sort of um, develops the business and I'd be happy to talk with you more too about your specific situation as far as what you're trying to do you know with your gigs other questions Anna, you got a question? No. Anybody else? Is, is that, is that, uh, I can't see, I'm blind. Yeah. Say again, I'm sorry. Oh, right, right. Yeah. But like you, at that point, you didn't know him, and then he didn't know you. Right. So why, 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 why do you ask him about? Yeah, I, I would, I, I, I had an introduction to somebody, and uh, and I just asked him for advice. What my father told me was, because I said, what am I going to ask this person for if I don't know who they are? I don't know what they want. I don't know how I fit with them. And he said, if you don't know what to ask for somebody, then ask them for advice. That was that was what he told me, which I found to be pretty good, pretty good advice. <laughs> um, ask. What did you actually ask? I think I probably said, I'm I'm a young violinist, and um, I'm I'm really hoping to succeed in the music business. Do you have? Any advice for me? Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Now, if I met today, if I met Herbie Hancock, and he just happened to be in town, I probably would not ask him for advice. <laughs> because he's too busy to give me advice. He's Herbie Hancock. <laughs> but, but, you know... I mean, some people are so busy and they get everybody asks them for advice. So there's also, it's a very delicate line. But if I had an introduction to him, if I had the right introduction to him, then I might ask him for advice. You know, if I met Herbie Hancock, I might give him a CD or send him a letter, a fan letter, you know, put it on my calendar to once a year send him a Christmas card, <laughs> you know, just to keep that relationship going. Um, But in general, I, if you have if, if if you do have an opportunity to speak to someone, I don't. It doesn't hurt to ask them for advice, you know. But respect their time at the same time. Don't expect that they have ten minutes to talk to you or twenty minutes. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Cool. Well, you're all welcome to follow up with me, everybody here live, anytime. And uh, I thank you for bearing with me on. The fifth day of Creative Strings Workshop, I'm running on fumes. I try to do my best to keep my train of thought, so I apologize if I, if I lost it a couple times. Um, anybody out there online, we've still got one more streaming event tomorrow morning. Eli Bishop is going to do a class. And um, we've got a Twitter hashtag, Creative Strings Workshop. So tweet about it. Please tell your friends. Put it on Facebook, some pictures some videos, talk about all the fun stuff you're doing, and uh, let's all have a great night. <laughs>